Natal has been the political theater of violence since the unbanning of political parties in 1990. You see, KZN stands out among South Africa's provinces for having the baddest reputation of politically linked assassinations. You see, the high levels of violence have created a climate of intimidation that threatens democracy. They say in KZN, might is right. You see, the police have a lot of power and it is getting worse. Now, over a hundred councillors have been killed over the past 15 years or so. Now, the overwhelming majority of assassinations are carried out using firearms, reflecting the widespread availability of illicit firearms and those diverted from legitimate sources such as the police force and private security companies. You see, illicit guns are everywhere in KZN and it's getting worse. During the apartheid days, the government of the time was supplying weapons to the Inkata Freedom Party so they could fight against the ANC to keep the people divided politically and that legacy of violence has never stopped. You see, these days, most of the killings happen amongst people who are in the same political parties. You see, everybody wants to be a councillor and if they lose the party elections, they don't want to accept the results so they'll put the hit on the one who's been elected or voted in so they could be the next one in line. You see, the reasons for politicians and councillors' killings in KZN are multidimensional, but at the heart of these murders is a battle for self-enrichment. Everyone wants to be a councillor, not to help the community, but to help themselves. You see, being a councillor also allows one to adjust lucrative municipal contracts, hire friends or relatives for jobs, and demand bribes if people want jobs or tenders. Basically, the councillors have become kingmakers to the tenderpreneurs. You have uh, uh, situations whereby political parties are having problems internally. And then in that case, what happens is that uh, people will be killing one another when they are vying for positions. And whenever that happens, the assumption will be that they've been killed by another political party, when actually killing has happened from within the party as a result of intra-party squabbles. But the second uh, causal factor is that uh, you will have a situation whereby uh, a, a, another political party wants to have control of a municipality or of a ward, and in that case, uh, they can't do it because uh, so and so is occupying that position. And they work on the assumption that uh, once you kill an incumbent politician, then there will be a by election, and you stand a chance of regaining that municipality or in then taking the municipality from the party that is currently controlling it. So that is how complex the situation is. We have not even brought in the criminal element. We have not brought in uh, differences that have nothing to do with politics, but we then creep in uh, whenever uh, we are heading for an election. So that is the complexity uh, of this particular situation. You see, the taxi industry is a breeding ground for hitmen, and KZN has a long history of taxi violence. Now, over the years, these guys have perfected their skills. Now, with some politicians in KZN having connections to taxi bosses, that gave them access to services of headmen, sometimes without even them communicating with these guys in person. You see, it's to a point now whereby most powerful players, whether in politics or business, have shooters on deck. It has become a lucrative business for headmen because sometimes they can make up to 500k per hit, depending on how high profile is the target. Now, assassinations in KZN are higher than all South Africa's other provinces combined. Now, some underworld members are connected to the ANC and the ANC has a strong support base in KZN. Now, people who are in positions of power through being a councillor, a mayor or ministers, they mostly have connections to gangsters or underworld bosses who are mostly involved with the taxi industry. And this is not only done by ANC party members, it can also be seen with other parties which are predominant in KZN. But the thing is, the ANC bears the largest share of assassinated councillors. 
You see, media reports show that the gunmen are often hired by fellow party activists who want to silence rivals or successors. A few honest councillors who blow the whistle on corruption and stop payments of fraudulent municipal contracts, they don't live long enough to see their honesty rewarded. Murders are often directly related to outcomes of state tenders or internal party elections. And there is a lot of money flowing in local government and people entrusted with dispensing these monies are vulnerable, especially in an environment that is indistinguishable from gangsters and taxi bosses who control shooters. You see, almost half of assassinations take place at the victims' homes, often when leaving for work or arriving home. You see, the killing of Spusiso, Spu Mapomolo, in 2018 is a typical case. Mapomolo was a ward councillor in Umlazi, KZN, and was shot several times as he arrived home from a meeting. Now, to underline the impunity, some terrified councillors who survive attacks are fearful of naming their attackers. Families of the deceased often choose to remain quiet or relocate rather than help the police track down their headmen or their paymasters. ANC members packed the court. The three suspects sat motionless in the dock. They are accused of killing Sibu Siso Mapumulo outside his home in Mlazim, south of Durban. Mapumulo was gunned down while seated in his car. Ntozi Sino Chiesam, the ANC ward councillor, is believed to be the mastermind behind the killing. His co accused are the alleged trigger men Kosnat Mbambo and Pumlani No Chiesam. No Chiesa is understood to have hired Mbambo to carry out the hit. The two accused denied they are linked, as alleged by the state. In October last year, popular councillor candidate Siabonga Mkize was shot dead while campaigning. This has resulted in a by-election, one of nine in the province. The ANC says safety is a concern here. Now we are having a very, very serious concern about the safety of the councillors, particularly in Wato One, because it's not the first one to be murdered. Former councillor Mzimuni Ngiba returns as an ANC candidate after Mkisa's death. The IFP, which is also contesting, is worried about the community. You can't have a candidate uh, with security guard with big guns uh, among the community that you are claiming that you are going to lead. Because I, for me, they are going to be uh, intimidated as they are intimidated right now. Now, whenever a councillor is assassinated in KZN, it's mostly the street-level hitmen who are arrested. The masterminds who hire the killers are rarely identified or prosecuted. You see, police are simply too afraid to go after the influential political godfathers who sponsor the murders for fear of stepping on sensitive political toes. Now, also in July, National Freedom Party councillor Nondom Bentle Mkun, who was 75 years at the time, was sleeping in her home in Nongom, where gunmen broke in during the night and shot her. She died on the scene. Her granddaughter, who was with her, survived with serious injuries. Isim Kunu was serving the volatile Nongoma local municipality, where power is constantly changing hands from an IFP-led coalition to an ANC-led coalition. You see, council meetings are now held visually, as councillors live in fear of being assassinated. After the IFP split in 2011, when Zanele Magwazamsebe started their own NFP party, that caused some tensions in certain municipalities. Now, in 2013, when the NFP was celebrating their second anniversary in Princess Magogo Stadium, police were unable to contain clashes between NFP and IFP supporters in Guamashu Section A. Now, Magwazamsebe was prevented from entering the area, and a journalist's car was set alight. The EFF have proven themselves to be a strong contender in the political space over the years and they are gaining some ground in KZN as well. As we've seen people like Mr. Magic Linda Spear publicly embracing them recently. Now besides the big four political parties in KZN which is ANC, DA, IFP and NFP, the EFF is also another strong party in KZN that's gunning for power. Now, as if the political tensions were not enough, recently former President Jacob Zuma launched Umkonto Wesizwe party, which is expected to have a bigger presence in KZN.
Now, with all these parties in that province, I don't know if there's enough council seats for everybody. Now, the EFF says it will fill up Moses Mobida Stadium when it holds its manifesto launch on the 10th of Feb, ahead of the national general elections. Now, the EFF party is hoping to get 1 million votes in this year's elections, hence the decision to hold the launch in KZN. You see, KZN is the second largest voter region after Gauteng, so winning that province can give you a lot of seats in parliament. Now, the president of Amapenga Nation, Ngezo Mkun, has threatened to stop the economic freedom fighters from hosting its manifesto at Moses Mabeda Stadium. Isengezo is one of the people who were charged with inciting riots during the 2021 looting period after Zuma was sent to jail. He is a big Jacob Zuma loyalist. You see, this guy, Ngezo, he really hates Julius. But their beef started after Malema's remarks about the Springboks. Malema claimed that the team's symbol is a symbol of white supremacy. Hey, but I think that was just an excuse to go at Julius. And this guy is threatening violence if Julius tries to host anything in KZN. And honestly, I don't think Ngezwe is a threat for a guy like Julius. But let me know in the comments if you think I'm wrong. This is how dictatorship is They are busy trying to create a political court and knowing that in South Africa, a South African people will never to allow a political devil. You are a political devil and you are nothing and you will ever nothing. They fear you all. I don't now, with KZN known for political violence, this year's elections are going to be interesting. There's going to be tensions between the MK and the ANC because Zuma's move may split the ANC, but we'll have to wait and see. But one thing for sure, the fights for council seats will be intense and councillors better get themselves armored vehicles because it's about to get lit. It has just become a norm now in KZN that if you're not strong enough, you're not going to hold a position of power for long. You see, democracy comes second. Might is king. You know, the problem here is anyone can be a councillor. There's no minimum requirements. You see, these council jobs must have a high and strict requirement process. And having a qualification should be high on the list. Because right now, anyone with money and shooters can become a councillor. And these types of councillors keep getting failed audits because they don't know what they're doing. They simply don't care. And they are corrupt. Anyway guys, this is all I had for today's episode. If you enjoyed the video, give us a like. You can give us a comment to share your opinion. And if you enjoy the content that we do, you can subscribe to the page. We appreciate it. Otherwise, peace to everybody.